This Lexus is an important Lexus, and not just because it's the brand's new NX midsize SUV, potentially its best-selling model. Nope, this one is important because it's a plug-in hybrid, a first ever for Lexus, and as a result, the most expensive NX you can buy. Question is, should you consider this one over the renowned regular hybrids that Lexus sells? And what sets it apart from its luxury plug-in hybrid rivals? We're gonna take a closer look, but before we do, remember to check out the full written review over on carsguide.com.au, where it'll live on the EV Guide site section, alongside other reviews of regular hybrids and plug-in hybrids and EVs too, as well as a large advice section, which will answer all of your EV questions. Now, if you are watching on YouTube and you are enjoying our videos, remember to hit those like, subscribe, and bell notification icons to stay up to date with all of our latest content. And for this video, here are the time codes so you can skip ahead to a part which most interests you. First up, let's take a look at pricing and specs. So we're looking at the plug-in hybrid version of the NX, dubbed the NX 450H+. It's the most expensive NX variant ever, wearing a somewhat eye-watering price tag of $89,900 before on-road costs, some $12,000 more than the regular hybrid NX 350H. Now, obviously what makes the plug-in version much more expensive is the larger high voltage battery, which allows it the ability to travel exclusively under electric power. But what's particularly interesting about this one is that it packs a relatively long electric only range for a plug-in at a claimed 87 kilometers. It has a few direct rivals, including the Mercedes-Benz GLC 300e, Volvo XC60 Recharge, and the BMW X3 xDrive 30e. And given all three of those Europeans carry significantly higher asking prices, it seems as though the Lexus breaks out of the gate with a bit of a value advantage. Standard equipment really took me aback as well, with the NX moving the game forward for Lexus generally. The cabin is simply packed with new tech, featuring an enormous 14-inch multimedia touchscreen, 8-inch digital dash, a head-up display, wireless phone charger, Primo 14-speaker audio system, full leather accented interior trim, dual zone climate, power adjustable front seats with heating and ventilation, as well as keyless entry with push start ignition. Meanwhile, on the outside, the NX 450H scores fully adaptive LED headlights, 20-inch alloy wheels, an F-Sport body kit with color matching highlights, and a powered tailgate. A polite addition, Lexus even chucks in this Type 2 to Type 2 charging cable, which you'll need to plug in at public charging locations like shopping centers, as well as the normal plug box, which you can plug in at your garage at home. So when you look at it on the face of it, the NX isn't as bad value as it first seems. Does not look good too. Let's check it out. Design is one of the things I love most about the new NX because it's improved out of sight compared to the previous car. In fact, I think the previous NX was my least favorite Lexus because it was so obviously just a Toyota RAV4 underneath. This one though, not only does it look the business, but it moves the Lexus brand forward in certain ways. Let's take a look. The NX has a newfound imposing stance on the road thanks to its significantly expanded dimensions with the signature Lexus descending roofline, massive wheels, and expansive spindle grille face. While I wouldn't call it elegant, it's certainly contemporary with the contours running down the bonnet and particularly the ones surrounding the rear wheel arch cutting a strong post-modern line. It looks distinct and importantly, far more resolved than its predecessor. To my eyes, for the first time, truly owning its place as a unique Lexus. Interesting touches this time around also include the tight face across the rear and sharp LED light clusters which at the front refine the formula and at the rear define it. If you thought the exterior was nice, wait till you get on the inside. This is where the real show is. The NX really launches Lexus into the era of contemporary design. Everything has been overhauled in here. And importantly, a lot of those elements which have historically held Lexus back have finally been put in the bin. Absolutely dominating the dash is this 14 inch multimedia touchscreen. It really looks the part. It's really nice and fast, even when you're using Apple CarPlay like I am now. And some clear thought has been given to the ergonomic design of it as well because it does tilt towards the driver and even the furthest elements are kind of easy to reach. That digital instrument cluster really looks the part as well. And while it's not super customizable, it is nice and fast with a smooth animation and harks back to Lexus's past with its single dial design. 
The dash design itself has been so tidied up. There's almost no buttons in here. And finally, Lexus has gotten rid of that awkward touchpad thing that you used to have to use to control the multimedia system in the past. It's all been moved into rather easy to use touch submenus, which is nice as well. Luxurious features in this car have not been forgotten. There's no question that the NX really is a premium car. There's all sorts of soft touch materials all down the doors, the center console here. Even running up the dash here is this nice soft piece for your knee to rest on, which is a nice attention to detail touch. Also from Lexus's past, excellent seats. They've been maintained in this car with really good side bolstering and nice padding below, making it comfortable to sit in for long periods. It might look good, but is it practical? Let's take a look. Practicality in the cabin is great too, and you'd hope so because the NX simply feels enormous, even compared to its predecessor. There's all sorts of nifty features in here, starting with this cool center console box, which is on a trick hinge. You can open it both ways, which is kind of cool if your passenger wants to use it as well. Now, in terms of storage, you've got a pocket in the doors here with a nice large bottle holder, takes our largest car's guide bottle, two large bottle holders here on the center console, which have been added because there's no messy touchpad system that there was before. And there's a floating wireless phone charger here, which can be pushed all the way back into the dash to reveal yet another storage area, which is simply brilliant. You also have great connectivity. There's a 12 volt hidden down there underneath that wireless charging pad, as well as a USB-C and USB-2 connector. So you've got all sorts of ways to connect your devices to this car as well as having a lot of extra space. Now moving up the dash here, there are some features which haven't been forgotten to make the car easy to use while you're actually driving. Not everything is a touch function. You can control some of the air conditioning features via shortcut buttons. There's a volume dial and climate dials as well. So that really just makes things easy. Now we are gonna hop in the back seat in a second, but before we do, we should mention the door handles because they are really weird. I'm not sure what Lexus was thinking with this, but instead of a standard door handle where you kind of mechanically pull it out and it unlatches the, the hook from the door, there's these electronic buttons which you press in and hold, and then you can open the door. Now that will depend on what state the car is in, whether the doors are locked, whether you're in drive or neutral or park and sometimes you have to do a double pull to get the doors open. It's all a little bit weird and my partner really hated it. Uh, so that's worth noting as well. Okay, so here in the back seat, and man, I love this seat trim. It's so nice and all that comfort from the front seat is really maintained back here, which isn't always the case. Room-wise, now, interestingly, I did mention how this car is really closely related to the RAV4. I feel like I don't quite have as much room in this car as I do in the RAV4. I'm not sure if that's a perception thing because of all of the dark trims and really, really deep tint on this window as well. But I still do have quite a bit of air space for my knees here, which is good, and for my head as well. Even though it's got a sunroof in the front, there's a quite an enormous amount of room there too. That's, that's pretty impressive. Now, storage-wise, there's a small pocket which just fits our Cars Guide bottle in that door. And a drop down armrest again with the nice trim, which will hold the bottle as well. In terms of amenities, you've got two adjustable air vents with a lock off and two USB-C ports and a 12 volt. That's all pretty good back here. Finally, there's the boot. Space comes in at 520 liters with the seats up and that's regardless of which NX variant you pick. Pretty good, but not near the top of the midsize SUV category. Interestingly, although it is closely related to that RAV4, it is 60 litres down, so some volume has to be sacrificed in pursuit of the NX's swoopy design. Now we get to the more complicated stuff. The NX 450H Plus has a 2.5 litre four-cylinder non-turbo engine you see here. It runs on something called the Atkinson cycle, which means it sacrifices power for efficiency with the idea that the electric motors will bring up the slack. Interestingly, the motors are the same as they are in the NX 350H regular hybrid. The difference with this plug-in version is the higher voltage battery, which lets them drive the wheels without the combustion engine's help at up to 130 kilometers an hour and for up to 87 kilometers, although that is to the NEDC rather than more strict WLTP driving cycle. Together with the engine, the system can produce up to 227 kilowatts and will allow the NX 450H Plus to sprint from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in just 6.3 seconds. Not bad for a car which has a curb weight of over 2 tons. 
Now, plug-in hybrids can wear what seems like kind of outrageous fuel claims. Here's the official number worn by the Lexus NX 450H+. Now, that of course is gonna depend on how much you can rely on this car's electric drive features. I've had this car for about a week. I've driven it a couple of hundred Ks over what I would consider a really fair balance of urban freeway miles and also using its hybrid and electric drive features. And here's the number I came to. And I'd actually consider that pretty good. The NX has a 55 litre fuel tank regardless of variant, meaning in this plug-in hybrid version, you can theoretically get over a thousand kilometers between fills. A word of warning, however, if you pick a plug-in hybrid, you really have to be willing to charge it up. Otherwise, you'll stress the engine out, dragging around a big battery, and you could well end up with a fuel number worse than if you simply bought a combustion model. Thankfully, this plug-in hybrid has great charging specs. Yes, the Lexus NX uses a European Type 2 standard charging port compatible with one of these cables here, the most popular kind in Australia. And it has a 6.6 .6 kilowatt AC inverter, allowing it to charge from the base charge level to 100% in just over two hours. Now that's really important because a lot of plug-in hybrids will only charge up at about half that speed. And that's the difference between me realistically being able to charge this car up at the shops while I do a grocery shop, or only really being able to get to a full charge when I can plug it in overnight at home. So something worth thinking about. Now, important specs for the battery. The NX450H has an 18.1 kilowatt hour, 355 volt lithium ion battery pack, which grants it that claimed range of 87 kilometers. However, that is to that NEDC standard. And in my testing, once it was at around about 100% charge, I was seeing more like 65 kilometers of fully electric driving range. That's still one of the largest electric driving ranges I've seen in a plug-in hybrid. The NX also has some really neat ways of controlling this, which we'll look at next. Okay, so the first thing you really notice about this new NX is how big it is. It really does feel almost as though I'm driving the previous generation RX, the next Lexus up. It really does feel wide and big. And yet I feel like I have really good visibility out of this car as well. I feel like I'm perched quite high off the road and can kind of peer down here through this nice windscreen. I've got nice mirror coverage out the sides. And even though that rear window is a little smaller due to the sort of coupe design of it, I don't feel like it creates too much of a blind spot. Now, the other interesting thing that I was looking out for straight away is even though this car is so closely related to that RAV4, it doesn't really feel related at all. There's a completely different steering tune, completely different suspension, completely different feel and ambience to the cabin. It's definitely in a class of its own, this Lexus, and really its own product. There's nothing RAV4-y about it that really jumps out at me. I think a lot of that is down into the differences to the tune of various things in this car. And one of them is the steering. It's really light and kind of whimsical in the RAV4 and makes that car feel lighter than it is and, and easier to steer around town. But in this Lexus, it's kind of artificially a bit heavier than you might expect, even regardless of which drive mode you pick. And that does give it a more luxurious feel, but it's also not quite as easy to kind of steer around town. It is a bit heavier than you'd expect from the RAV4, which is interesting. Now what separates this Lexus from other Lexus and Toyota hybrids is the high voltage battery pack. And that lets the electric motors on both the front and rear axle have a full range of motion up to 135 Ks thereabouts. And that's great because it means you can legitimately use it as an EV pretty much all week if you've got somewhere to charge it up. You're not getting to 85 kilometers on the freeway and then the engine kicks in to support it. Now, another thing you should know about plug-in hybrids though is all of them kind of work a little bit differently and they have different modes which let you play with the amount of electrification that you have. In this case of the Lexus system, you have three modes fully electric, which is nice, smooth, and quiet, just like an EV. Then using the buttons on the center console, you can also set it to a charge mode and a hybrid mode. And that essentially lets this system work exactly like a standard Toyota series parallel hybrid. That kind of system that you've come to know and love, it will literally drive like that. And it does a pretty good job of maintaining the amount of range stored in that battery pack. So. 
that's kind of good for those trips where you might be spending a lot of time on the freeway and you don't want to just drain the electric battery straight away. You want to kind of maintain it and use it when you get to your destination for much better fuel efficiency overall. In that case, you'd put it in the hybrid vehicle mode on the freeway and that way the petrol engine is being used where it's most efficient on the freeway and then when you get to your destination you might be traveling at slower or stop start speeds you can then revert it back to ev mode and use it that way as well it also helps if you don't have a place you can charge up easily for whatever reason but i wouldn't drive it like that all of the time just because you're really not making the most of it if you want to make the most of it and get the great fuel efficiency that is on offer from this car you really do need to utilize that ev driving mode where you can now the other interesting mode that this car has is a charge up mode so if again you don't have somewhere to charge it up and maybe you've just filled up with particularly cheap fuel you can actually just run the engine and drive this car essentially as a combustion vehicle with a little bit of electrical assistance and when the engine's idling you're stuck at traffic or something like that it will actually just charge the battery up uh, but it is just a, a useful kind of customizable feature to have and not every plug-in hybrid has that. In fact, not every plug-in hybrid is as smooth between the drive components either. That's something that Toyota has proven, and Lexus by extension, has proven that they are masters of. The hybrid drive is so sleek. There's a lot of the time where, unless I'm looking at the monitor, I actually don't know when the engine is on. And that's pretty impressive because it's a hard thing to master, especially when you start to include things like transmissions and even though this car has a continuously variable transmission, which sounds like a bit of a, a dirty word when it comes to luxury cars, it really isn't. It's better than a cheap dual clutch, which has that glitchy action. In terms of electrification, there is one thing this car doesn't seem to have, which I would like to see, and that's that you can't control the regen braking. It is quite a mild regen braking tune, so you're not really recouping as much energy as I think these motors are capable of recouping when you're in that kind of stop-start traffic scenario. And that does mean when you are driving it as an EV, it's not the most efficient EV that it could be. And that's just a little bit of a shame, which brings us into some of the other downsides of this car. I already mentioned the steering tune is a bit heavier than the RAV4, which might be a turn-off for some people, but I think it still does have quite a nice natural progression to it. So it doesn't feel kind of artificial and nasty. One of the biggest downsides for me though is perhaps the suspension tune, which I was a little bit disappointed by. It's not to say it's a bad suspension tune, and this top spec car does have the supposedly more fancy active setup, which changes with the drive modes. It's just got a bit of a sharp edge to it, and that's a shame because the RAV4 does have such a nice, soft, balanced, and comfortable ride for this midsize SUV segment. Now, the reasons why that ride might not be quite as good in this specific car is because it does have enormous 20-inch wheels. And with the whole plug-in setup, this car has a curb weight which weighs in at over two tons. So that probably doesn't play as nicely with the suspension as it might in other variants, the combustion variants or the uh, lesser hybrid variants with the much smaller battery. And that leads us into road noise as well. Like the suspension, it's not bad, but this is a luxury feeling product. It's not as good as it could be. I think again, that's down to those large wheels and low profile tires. But when you get a bit of a coarse chip tarmac under the car, it, it just gets a little bit too noisy in here, especially for the kind of cabin ambience that's promised. Now, another thing about the NX 450H Plus is that it can be properly quick when it needs to be. You stick it in sport mode and it will accelerate really quite fast as those electric motors kind of unleash their potential. Now Lexus claims it will sprint from zero to 100 in kind of that mid six second bracket. And for a car which weighs as much as this one does, that is properly impressive. But one thing I will note is that it doesn't handle as well as a German performance rival. While you're in that kind of price bracket, this is still a more luxury focused car with a kind of a bit of a softer ride. And when you do tilt it into the corners a bit more, you feel the weight of those batteries and you feel the car tilt in and it just doesn't quite have that performance edge that you might be looking for at this price. So while it is quick in a straight line, 
I would stop short of saying that it is actually a performance SUV in that sense. So where does that leave us with the NX 450H Plus? Well, this is certainly more in the luxury realm than it is in the performance realm. But I think most importantly, it really does focus on making the most out of its electric features to really make an efficient car that's easy to use. And that's one of the challenges that really does face plug-in hybrid vehicles generally is that they're difficult to use. This car has a long range, it's comfortable to drive, and it has these customizable drive modes, all of which are pretty breezy and pretty self-explanatory. And that, I think, is half the battle. In terms of active safety, the NX has everything thrown at it and a little bit more, including freeway speed, auto emergency braking with a new junction assist, lane keep assist with lane departure warning, blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic alert, adaptive cruise control and road sign assist. If you want to read a little bit more about these features as well as the array of 10 airbags this car has, remember to check out the full written review on carsguide.com.au. At the time of filming, the new generation NX was yet to be rated by ANCAP. Lexus currently offers an industry standard five year and unlimited kilometer warranty promise for the car. And for the battery, there's a separate industry leading 10 year and unlimited kilometer warranty. Service costs are very competitive for the premium space set out at $495 for the first three years. It's flat across the NX range and as such seems like pretty good value for this plug-in hybrid with its more complicated drive components. Specifically for the 450H Plus, Lexus also throws in a complimentary home charger installation as well as membership to its premium ownership program which includes something called Lexus On Demand which lets owners swap into another vehicle for up to eight days at a time. The NX 450H Plus is a leading example for plug-in hybrids because it takes a lot to switch to this technology, so you need all the things that this car gets right, and that includes a long range, the fast charging, and the totally customizable hybrid drivetrain, which really lets you make the most of its electric features. What remains to be seen, though, is if there's a market for a plug-in hybrid like this when Lexus already offers quite a good parallel hybrid. Do you think there's space for it? Tell us what you think, and remember, read the full written review over on carsguide.com.au.